Welcome everyone and here we are at episode 24. Hello Father. Hello Christine, good day, good day How to you. Are you okay? I'm well, I'm well, thank God, yes. Good. Okay, well would you please lead us in the opening prayer Father? Yes, of course. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you. We thank you for this beautiful opportunity to study the faith, to study the Catholic faith. And we thank you for the gift of your Son. Uh, we thank you for the gift of St. John Paul II and his life-giving charism and message uh, for our times. We ask, as always, for a greater receptivity in our hearts and minds to receive and understand more fully and live more truly, more authentically, this teaching in our lives, in our families and our communities. We ask for the intercession of Mary, our Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, our beloved patron, and of St. John Paul II himself. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, before we get into uh, the contents of today's episode, um, we thought we just might start with a brief summary of the event that we had on Tuesday night on Zoom, on the TOB Network UK Zoom call, where we were very blessed to have Christopher West lead us in um, a study on his new book, Eating the Sunrise. So, Father, do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, there it is. Yes, here it is, uh, Christine. Yeah, it was just, um, I guess it took me back to the uh, the beginning of this TOB network, uh, Christine. You know, you'll remember we started with a couple of book studies and it was wonderful. Um, I know it was online and it was in the, the craziness of the lockdown, but still there was a genuine fellowship uh, that was formed by a very faithful number of um, followers. And so it reminded me a bit of that, you know, seeing some familiar faces um, online, which was lovely. And the, the group sharing that we had in the in the breakout rooms and of course, Christopher West, wow, I mean, he's so gifted, so inspirational, so enthusiastic about this message. And he, he communicates that enthusiasm and, joy, enthusiasm and joy so well. But I just felt it was great, Christine. It was a real privilege. And um, I just, uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the next one. So it was a great, uh, a great um, boost, I think, for us all. Yeah, it really was. And if anyone's listening now and would like to sign up to attend the next session with us and with Christopher, that will be on the 7th of May, 8 o'clock UK time. And all you need to do is send an email to our network and you'll be registered and then you'll be sent the link for the next session live um, from America with Christopher West. So the email again is tobnetworkuk at gmail.com. So just send us an email and you'll be registered on the database and then you'll be kept up to date with all the necessary links and information. But yeah, it's definitely not to be missed. His enthusiasm is really very infectious, isn't it, Father? Yeah. And as we've been saying, uh, Christine, we, you know, as our faithful listeners know, we are into the fourth year of this network. It's hard to believe. And almost everything, I think nearly everything we have delivered has come completely free. And so there's a little reminder, um, if people can help um, with some generous donations, please do. Even this book study with Christopher West, who has got to be one of the the most well-known, really, and one of the top speakers in the Catholic Church. I think that's fair to say. He's giving of his time uh, completely free. Uh, so it's a, a golden opportunity for everyone to learn and to go deeper and to have some real quality time uh, with Christopher West, who is who is really um, 
given his life uh, to promote this message and given his life really in his time and his energy to the church, you know, which is such a gift. So please do uh, come on board um, with us and uh, send out this message, you know, to all your family and friends to log in um, on Tuesday evening from 8 p.m. UK time. It's such a, a great opportunity to grow in faith and enthusiasm. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's get on to general audiences. Uh, we're on 42 and 43 now, unbelievably. Um, and this section is entitled, in the text, it's entitled, Has Committed Adultery in the Heart? And then the subtitle is The Key Phrase. And John Paul II opens general audience 42 by reminding us that we are still examining this brief quote from the Sermon on the Mount, from which John Paul II draws out such deep and profound truths. So that quote, again, just to remind anyone who hasn't um, been with us earlier, the quote is, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, John Paul II explains how his method of analyzing this text has been to um, dissect it into three sections. The first sentence, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, he analyzed in general audiences 35 to 37. The second part of the um, scripture passage, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to desire her wrongfully, we looked at in general audiences 38 to 41. And then today we're moving on to analyze this third part of the quote, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And this is what he analyzes in audiences 42 to 44. And in discussing his method of breaking up the text into these three discrete sections, he states that each part has its own profound depth and connotations, but also that each part must be read and understood in light of the others and also in the text as a whole. And he says that he's searching for the ethical meaning in the text. And if you remember, as we said previously, Christ is teaching his listeners on the Sermon in the Mount a new ethos, which is a new way of seeing, a new way of being. And that from this new way of seeing and being arises a new ethics, a new way of living, a radical new way to live. So it's no longer a case of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's a case of turning the other cheek. It's no longer a case of just loving your friends and family. It's loving your enemies as well. So the inauguration of the new ethos on the Sermon on the Mount is radical. And I was thinking as I was reading through this general audience, Father, that it reminded me very much of um, the scene in The Passion of the Christ that we tend to watch every Good Friday. <laughs> And it's the scene where Jesus is carrying his cross and he falls to the ground. And as he lifts his eyes, he catches the gaze of his mother. And it's just so powerful. And then he seems to draw from her all this strength to pick himself up and lift up the cross. And he says the words from Revelation. He says, behold, I make all things new. And really, that's what he's also saying in the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to make all these commandments. He's not dispensing with them, but he's going to make them all new, a new way of living, a new way of being. Um, and then in the audience, general, uh, general audience 42, John Paul II then says he needs to address the fact that um, some people might view this um, quotation, has committed adultery in the heart, as some kind of a metaphor, just a linguistic tool just to emphasize the sinfulness of concupiscence. And so he then has this subtitle, A First Reading, and he takes us through the logical steps of someone who might view this just as a metaphorical tool. And so he proceeds in a very logical manner and he takes us on this logical journey. So he says, step one, actual adultery is obviously an external act quite clear what it is. It's a man having, in this case, because we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, a man who has sex with a woman who's not his wife. And then he says, the next part of the scripture passage, whoever looks at a woman to desire her wrongfully, this is an interior act. 
Uh, it's an act of concupiscence and it's wrongful desire. It's wrongful looking, as we said last week. And then he says, if it's wrong for a man to look at a woman to desire her lustfully, he asks the question, but what about his own wife? Is it legitimate for a husband to look at his own wife in this way? And would Christ, does Christ approve such a look? And he then takes us again on a logical step-by-step um, -step process to answer that question. And he sets out again certain facts. And he says, only the man who is the potential subject of actual adultery is eligible to be accused of committing adultery in the heart. So obviously man would have to be married. Next point, he says, but in this case, the object of the look is not another woman, but it's his legitimate wife. Therefore, he cannot commit adultery with his own wife. Therefore, the look that he gives his wife cannot be considered adultery in the heart. So superficially, in answer to the question, it would appear that once you're married, this lustful look is okay, that it's a legitimate look within marriage. But, and then there's the big but, John Paul II then says this, and I'll quote it in full. He says, nevertheless, there are fundamental doubts whether this reasoning, which is what we've just gone through, takes into account all the aspects of revelation and theology of the body that need to be considered above all when we want to understand Christ's words. So we need to take in the much bigger picture of everything that we've studied thus far to reach this point. And he says, once we take into account the analysis that we've conducted so far on the dignity of the human person made in the image and likeness of God, as we saw from that in-depth analysis of that word beginning that took us all the way through Genesis, he says this carries such theological weight that we have to then broaden and more importantly deepen our understanding. And so Christ's statement in the Sermon on the Mount um, confirms the prohibition on adultery, of course, he upholds the Decalogue, but he actually does so much more than just that. He goes beyond that juridical realm of adultery, applying only to a legally married man. And he takes this notion of looking to desire a woman beyond the objective external act and right into the realms of the heart, the mind, the intellect and the will. And he says, um, John Paul says, Christ makes the moral evaluation of desire depend above all on the personal dignity of the man and the woman. And this is important both in the case of unmarried persons and perhaps even more so in the case of spouses. So as we said last week, we are all, um, as we know, made in the image and likeness of God. We are persons, not things. We are not to treat another human person as a thing or an object of our own personal satisfaction. And so lust is not just an issue for unmarried people. Lust in marriage is also wrong because it tramples on this notion of self-gift. And we talked about that last week. Married persons are called to make a complete and total gift of self, one to the other, not to merely focus on one aspect of their spouse for selfish ends. And so as John Paul II says, we need to make the distinction between good desire and bad desire, between total self-giving love and lust and the selfishness that comes with lust. And he says that lust changes the spousal relationship, the husband and wife. Um, they're not there just to satisfy a sexual urge. He says they're there as a gift to be treasured and cherished. Um, so that was my points for today, Father, on General Audience 42. If you want to add anything in? Well, just to say, yes, it's beautiful, Christine. You know, it really is. It's a beautiful teaching and a, a beautiful synopsis uh, that you've given us. Um, and as you say, I think these two audiences, 42 and 43, are very much connected. Um, so we have, as you mentioned, the first reading and then into audience 43, the, the second reading. Um, so John Paul II goes very logically through the, um, the sequences, if you like. 
And I guess overall, the movement is towards interiority, that movement of the heart. That's, I think, what the, the new ethos is, is trying to address. And so there's a very couple of beautiful quotes that are really continuing from what you've said um, in audience 42 into audience 43. And this is from paragraph two. Um, Adultery in the heart is not committed only because the man looks in this way at a woman who is not his wife, but precisely because he looks in this way at a woman. <laughs> so um, it's it's just a beautiful um, a beautiful way of him explaining, helping us to see. Uh, getting to the heart of the matter, you know, in, in every way. Father, just excuse me a minute. You carry on. I'm just going to go and see to the dog. I'll be back in a second. Yeah, yeah, I'll carry on. I'll carry on. <laughs> and so um, we have then into uh, paragraph three, a couple of important themes that we have looked at, I think, the last time, uh, last week. Uh, and so again, to quote, such a reduction has the effect that the person, in this case, the woman, becomes for the other person, the man, above all, an object of the possible satisfaction of his own sexual urge. In this way, a deformation, he says, takes place in the reciprocal four which loses its character as a communion of persons in favor of the utilitarian function. It makes use of the woman, of her femininity to satisfy his own drive. And so we have, again, these two components um, that John Paul II is really emphasizing the reduction that the concupiscent look um, draws uh, the man into and also this utilitarian that as you said Christine even the married man can make use of his wife's femininity and her body in a very demeaning and undignified manner and so it's always getting to the the heart of the matter um, and then in the um, in the edition that we're we're covering from Wallstein, he he has this translator's note that this specific teaching in audience uh, forty three made big headlines in the national media. I I had this you know recollection as I was reading through this, um, and again you had this. Um, this secular understanding as if to say that two married people just consenting can somehow abuse each other's bodies that this means that anything can anything goes anything can can happen and how dreadfully damaging that is when you actually sit down and think about it that just because you're married it means you can just as you say trample over the dignity of your spouse and uh, just the dreadful damage uh, that that can do. And so um, it's not difficult for us to, to, to see the, the, the warped view of our media and the secular mentality. And uh, John Paul II speaking, you know, so beautifully into that. And then just moving on, uh, a, a few other points, Christine, into um, paragraph five. What is John Paul II doing? He's getting to the, as I say, the heart of the matter. He consequently shows how deep down it is necessary to go, how the innermost recesses of the human heart must be thoroughly revealed so that the heart might become a place in which the Lord is fulfilled. So as we mentioned the last time, the demanding nature of Christ's teaching 
And I and as I was reading this myself, thinking, wow. I think anyone um who has an honest reflection on their own mind, their own thought patterns can see how easily we can stray away from a purity of heart, um, how easily just in our daydreaming, even in times of prayer, we can be troubled uh, by images maybe from the past or um, just moments of weakness when we can draw people away from that inherent dignity into a very reductionist uh, vision that is just self-seeking and self-serving and self-gratifying. And that is the very um, the very core uh, of who we are. And that is the very core of um, what the Holy Spirit wants to change in this new ethos. So it's it's really beautiful. And so finally, Christine just goes on to um, has this beautiful teaching of purity of heart that I think um, he comes back to in later audiences. And again, this is um, furthering his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. So the very end of uh, paragraph five um, in audience 43, Christ, by contrast, teaches that one fulfills the commandment by purity of heart in which human beings cannot share without firmness in facing everything that has its origin in concupiscence of the flesh. Purity of heart is gained by the one who knows how to be consistently demanding from his heart, from his heart and from his body. So again, these beautiful um teachings that we have to face um everything uh, we we cannot share without firmness in facing everything that has its origin in concupiscence of the flesh what does that mean well we have to be honest uh christine we have to be firm with ourselves what is preventing me from attaining that purity of heart what are the obstacles and um, what are the habits, the occasions of sin, if you like, um, that still needs healing, uh, things that still need to be rooted out, so to speak, um, of the heart, of my mind, of my imagination to be cleansed so that I can truly have that vision of God. And then finally, this really gave me hope Um you know, the very last paragraph in this teaching, it says that the words spoken by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount have without any doubt such a universal and deep reach. Wow, well, we've established that. Absolutely. Only in this way can they be understood on the lips of him who knew to its final depth what was in every man. That's a quote from John 2, 25. And so Jesus knows uh, the extent of the wound in our concupiscent heart and the extent in which he had to endure for that healing, for that salvation. And who at the same time carried within itself the mystery of the redemption of the body, as St. Paul put it, should we fear the severity of these words? Well, yes, at times I do, Christine. I'm not going to lie. You know, as I say, an examination of my heart some days, you know, when I'm having a bad day, I'm like, wow, you know, this is a challenging, a challenging teaching and no less in our present, you know, pornified culture. Should we fear the se severity of these words or rather, this is beautiful, have confidence in their salvific content, in their power? And that is a beautiful hope, Christine. Why? Because we have faith in the power of the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. Jesus is not offering this gift of purity of heart in some false, unrealistic way. Yes, it is demanding. 
Yes, it requires firmness. It requires us to be consistently demanding. But it is attainable through the grace of God, through the sacraments of the church, through reconciliation and through frequent um, absorbing of the Eucharist and our prayer life and the intercession of Mary and all the saints, Saint Joseph, the terror of demons, one of my big heroes. And so it's a wonderful teaching, Christine, very, very challenging uh, but i think important for us to hear important for our men maybe in first and foremost to hear to really encourage men uh, to stand up uh, to step up and to be brave and courageous in the living of this teaching and to really um respect and understand and welcome uh, the the feminine you know the the women in their lives as a gift so i find it very rewarding christine to meditate and, and to reflect with you uh, you know on these on these profound teachings of, of saint john paul the great yeah and isn't it a powerful way I mean, as you were talking there father i was thinking about how we prepare ourselves for confession and and how important it is to have that honest dialogue with what's actually going on not at the superficial level of whatever actions we've undertaken but actually what was going on in our heart at the time and that's the honest conversation that we have to have with ourselves to prepare for confession isn't it and then to be free yeah that's so, it christina and i find you know i find our young people today welcome that honesty you know, often they're crying out, uh, they recognize uh, their struggles with great humility and really desire to be helped. And so that honesty does flow and it's very refreshing. We say, okay, um, this is, um, you know, my, my struggle. I have had, uh, you know, a challenging time with pornography um, as a younger man or a younger woman, um, maybe relationships uh, in the past. Um, and I, I find that people, you know, young people are very honest and we can help, you know. Um, this teaching, I think, can help to reconstruct a healthy uh, sense of masculinity, a healthy sense of femininity um, and a healthy sense of fatherhood and motherhood. Um, so it's a really a vital, vital teaching, I think, for our times. Yeah. And when we also, when we talk about heroes, it's so much more powerful to hear about when we're talking about men and, and their attitude to women, how, how more attractive it is if there's a man who has got and has developed the virtues of self-control and um, self-determination and the virtues of chastity. That's very attractive rather than a man who's given into all of the temptations that the world is offering and thinks that that's where he finds his masculinity and his manhood. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about that in a previous episode, but for young men to hear that that's actually what's really attractive, I think that's yeah. Absolutely, Christine, absolutely. I mean, there's, I was just, um, you know, reflecting further on, 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 on sort of notes that I'd made, you know, in previous talks and there's, um, there's a very uh, powerful piece that I think we covered. Um, it's way back in audience 15. Um, and it's no harm, I guess, to go over it again. It's part of it is the catechism uh, teaching on self mastery, which I think is what you're you're getting at in in um, paragraph 2342 of the catechism. It says that self-mastery is a long and exacting work as john paul ii is 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 really repeating one can never consider it acquired once and for all it presupposes renewed effort at all stages of life and then it goes on into audience uh, 15 here we mean freedom above all as self-mastery or self-dominion so someone is in possession of a self, as you say, they're not just being drawn by all these, their feelings and their impulses, their urges, like an animal. 
under this aspect, self-mastery is indispensable in order for man to be able to give himself, in order for him to become a gift, in order for him to be able to find himself fully through a sincere gift of self. And that teaching is very clearly um, recorded in one of the Vatican documents, one of the main Vatican documents, Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 24. Um, and I think taken from, from John Paul II, influential in, in terms of his contribution. And so we have, yeah, this formation of the character um, so important for our young men, a uh, formation in virtue, um, so that they're able to give themselves to their bride in a very beautiful way. But that presupposes a degree of self-possession, of self-control, uh, that I'm in possession uh, of myself so that I'm able to give um, to the other. So really fundamental truths, fundamental tenets of our mentoring of our young men, I would say, um, in terms of the formation of their character so that they can establish a foundation from which to live uh, their vocation from God. Absolutely. Well, that's probably a good point to stop at, Father, looking at the clock. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Christine. I'm we'll enjoying see. this journey. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see everyone next time. God bless. God bless. Thank you.